to thank the organizers for the lovely poster. Um, uh, just so that you're not in confusion, the two philosophers are not pictured, but one of them is. Uh, uh, this, uh, the, today's talk is about Aquinas, uh, who is uh, in rather spelt form there uh, on the right, um, and, uh, and Descartes. So I want, to, I want to talk to you about Aquinas and, and Descartes. However, uh, as to the picture of the other fellow, uh, I discovered in some amusement as I was driving up today, I thought, I thought it was over, and I realized that um, I happen now to be wearing the same sport coat that I <laughs> And I'd just like you to know that I do own a couple of other sports coats. <laughs> if you ever go up to Anthony, I can show them to you. So, um, uh, you know, uh, just to give you some idea of my income back that I spent. <laughs> Um, so, I want to talk to you today about the uh, problem of creation. And I want to talk to you about this problem as a genuine and, to my mind, one of the most important philosophical problems. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about creation as, uh, as a problem in theology, and a lot of people who are concerned about uh, the alleged incompatibility of thinking in terms of creation and something like evolution. Um, but what I want to show you is that fundamentally for thinkers in the great Catholic tradition, including both Aquinas and Descartes, this problem is really a matter of philosophy. There is a, a huge theological dimension to it, but it, at, at the basis, it's a problem about God's causing the world. And what God causes in the world is something that we can know something about. Uh, if we get beyond the ontological argument and think about the arguments that Aquinas and uh, Descartes will give us. And so I, I want you to try to see this uh, as they saw it, as a, as a philosophical problem. Now, if we're talking about God's causing the world, there are two big problems you want to avoid. That is, if you are uh, trying to speak for this, this broad tradition. On the one hand, some philosophers, they're called old. <laughs> 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 um, some philosophers take the view that God's causality is rather slight in all of this. Uh, if you are a deist, your view is that God causes things at the very beginning in some way, either by making the whole thing or by setting things in motion. But thereafter, God does nothing. And that, for a believer, is really wrong. Because if you're a Christian believer, you want to say that God not only did something, whatever it was, at the very beginning, but God is with us, answering prayers, can infuse grace, uh, is, uh, has, has entered into history. I mean, there's a, there are quite a number of things that believers want to say is true. So deism, although it may be a theistic position, is really not a Christian position. I'll, I'll make that <laughs> claim. So on the one hand, you want to avoid being a deist. But on the other hand, you want to avoid the other extreme. The other extreme it goes by the name of occasionalism. And if you are an occasionalist, a uh, famous version of that is uh, Nicholas Malbranche, uh, but if you are an occasionalist, you think that God is really causing everything. So on the occasion uh, that I uh, move this chair, really, that motion was caused by God. If you, if you, if you take the uh, occasionalist view, I, I in some way provide the occasion, but actually God is doing everything in the world. So Aquinas and Descartes are both trying to avoid these two wrong extremes. On the one hand, they want to avoid deism, which has God doing far too little. And on the other hand, they want to avoid occasionalism, which has God doing far too much. Okay, that, fair enough? Okay. Now, my thesis is Aquinas is successful on both counts. He avoids deism and he also avoids occasionalism. Descartes, 
I want to argue, avoids deism all right, but falls into occasionalism. And so it's it's two philosophers, but I think one's better. <laughs> <laughs> so as a as a, as a tomist of the strict observance, uh, I suppose you're not surprised. All right. Watch the time. <clears throat> First off, I'm going to give you in a uh, kind of bare outline the argument that Aquinas gives to try to prove that there is such a thing as, as creation. In order to think about this, you have to kind of think about this sort of basic, fundamental, metaphysical idea of being or, or existence. Philosophers begin to wonder, well, why, why, is, why is there something rather than nothing? Why, 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 why is the universe existent rather than not existent? And what's fundamental to everything is that anything that is real, from the smallest particle to the largest uh, mountain, is that they, you, you would say that it, it, it exists, it has being. So being is a kind of fundamental thing that belongs to everything that we know. And metaphysically, for Aquinas, it is absolutely the foundation of, 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 of his entire metaphysical outlook. All right. So Aquinas wants us to think about the problem of existence. Like what, why is it that things exist? Now, uh, the text that I circulated, it, you don't have to worry about it if you haven't seen it, but in, in that text and in a number of other texts, Aquinas makes the point that you can recognize kind of degrees of being. You, you can kind of see that some things exist more and other things exist less. Um, and what, what does he mean by that? Well, what he means is that when, we, when you see that sort of thing, you, are, you, you can recognize that when there is a kind of a, a more and a less, this more and less is explained by the fact that what you're talking about is actually received. It, it, it's, it's something that you got from outside of yourself. So the example of Linus uses is heat. And this is a good example for Canadians. Uh, so uh, on a cold day, you go into the, your, your cabin in the woods. And uh, what? It's a wood stove. OK, it's cold outside. So. The, <laughs> This is not rocket science. If you sit closer to the wood stove, you are warmer. If you sit farther away, you're cooler, right? So here are degrees of heat. If you're, if you're closer to the source, you're, you're warmer. If you're farther away, you're colder. OK, so Aquinas uses that as an example to illustrate this idea of participation. And Aquinas sort of takes that idea and applies it metaphysically to uh, the the world as he sees it, and the world as he sees it is kind of hierarchically ordered in terms of being. So at the lowest level, you have material things that are not alive. And then above that, you've got things that are living. And above that, you've got things that are not only living, but they, they can move themselves. And above that, you've got human beings that not only can move themselves, but are, are rational. And above that, in Aquinas' view, there are angelic beings that are even more intellectual than we are, and finally there's God. So you, you have this sort of a, a hierarchy of, of being, and Aquinas says, if you kind of look at that idea, you're, you're seeing something analogous to what you would see when you're talking about heat. You're, you're closer and farther away from, from the source. And so Aquinas says, the point of this is for us to recognize that the being of things, their existence, really doesn't belong to any of these things by nature. Again, it's like the analogy of the, of the heat. You're, the heat that you're getting is coming from, from somewhere else. The closer you are, the, the more you're going to get it. The farther away, the less you're going to get. And so Aquinas uses this idea to try to draw out his one of his basic metaphysical claims, which is that for all of the beings that we know in this world, none of them has 
by its own nature, its own being, or its own existence. And so in that sense, all of us are, are borrowers in terms of existence. We exist, but the fact of existence is not, does not come from our own nature. There's nothing about being a human being, a dog, a dinosaur, a mountain, or the universe that says that any of these things has to exist. They do exist, but the fact of their existence doesn't come from what they are. It comes in some way from outside. So Aquinas is ready to say the cause of being or the cause of existence cannot come from the nature of any of the things that we experience in this world. Okay. And if that is so, then we must look for the sort of thing that could be the cause of this existence. And uh, Aquinas would say the only thing that could cause existence would be the sort of thing that doesn't itself require ultimately a cause of its existence. And so it would have to be something whose existence was, so to speak, his very nature. It was to, to, to exist is really what this being is. And, and that, he says, is what we meant by God. Okay. Now, is this sounding completely strange, or are you making some sense of this? Are you, are you oh, uh, roughly okay? I mean, I'm very happy to go back to this at, at the end. We can, we, can, we can talk this over. Um, but I, I want you to get some sense that for Aquinas, it, as a matter of philosophy, the, the existence of things is not a sort of given of the things that we know in this world. The existence has to be caused from the outside. And once you, once you recognize that, Aquinas would say, you're on your way to recognizing that this the, the, the cause could only be a cause that itself is uncaused, and uh, it's going to have to be gone. The root of this argument, again, is this idea that the nature of no limited thing, no thing in our experience, no thing in, that we could you know, sort of possibly deal with in, in, in terms of limited being, the nature of none of these things has to exist. These things do exist but they, they don't have to. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Should go back to talking about sport books as well as we can say. <laughs> All right. Let me read uh, one uh, passage to you. Uh, it's not the one that I, uh, I sorry, yeah, it is, it is uh, no, it's, it's from an earlier text, not the one that I read. I mean, it's, it's short. The nature of being, Aquinas says, is found in all things, in some more nobly, in others less nobly, so this degrees business, such that the natures of things themselves are not the very being that they have. Otherwise, being would belong to the concept of the essence of anything, which is false, since the essence of anything can be understood without understanding whether the thing exists. Natures must, therefore, have being from something else, and there must ultimately be a nature that is its own being. Okay, that's the argument. All right. If that is so, what does Aquinas mean by creation? Well, Thomas Aquinas says that this act, this activity of God, this action of causing being, can be understood to mean two things uh, philosophically, two, two fundamental things. First, when you say that things are created, Aquinas would say, out of nothing, what you really mean is to deny that there is any, what Aristotle would have called, material cause involved in creation. There is no, when God makes things, there isn't a, a supply, a, 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 a matter sitting around. There isn't, there isn't a, a, a store or something. There isn't, you know, a, a, a lumber yard. You know, God doesn't make creatures out of something. So to say that God creates out of nothing, which is the phrase that is usually used, means, Aquinas says, that 
he's not making creatures out of something. In other words, there is no material cause, there is no sort of prior condition, no sort of prior stuff uh, out of which uh, the creature is made. So if this is true, this means that God is causing everything. So there, you know, the, the, there's, there's, it's not as though when we make something, um, if a carpenter builds a table, well, the, you know, the, the wood is going to determine something about the way that the table is going to look, or if, if you uh, uh, sew a dress or make, make something out of a certain kind of material, the material that you use is going to determine the, the kind of product that you're going to get in the end. So what we use in, in terms of materials sort of determines the result. Well, that, nothing like that would be true in the case of creation. It, it, God is causing everything. So there's, it's not as though there is some part of the creature that was sort of was there. Plato, in the Timaeus, had talked about the demiurge um, making the world out of a kind of pre-existent uh, sort of uh, necessary uh, stuff. And uh, that kind of uh, material uh, necessity sort of determines or limits the result. But the, the, the point is that creation is not at all like that. It's, if we're creating out of nothing, it's, it's a total uh, act. And, and nothing would escape God's causality. Also, if God is really creating, uh, in this sense, with, with no uh, material cause, it would indicate that the act of creation is not a way of changing things. And this turns out to be a very important idea. God, in creating things, is not making them different. He's making them to be at all. They wouldn't be at all. He's not, he's not rearranging something that's there. He's not altering uh, something that's there. He's, he's making it to be, and if, and if he didn't, nothing would be. Okay. So the first sense is of, of this of creation out of nothing is that when God creates, there's no material cause at all. He's not. He's not making something out of something else. The second sense, second philosophical sense, is that when you say that creatures are made out of nothing, you mean, Aquinas says, in a very fundamental way, to affirm the kind of nothingness of creatures. <laughs> you mean to say that cre creatures are made out of nothing, and in fact, left to themselves, would be nothing. In other words, God's making of things cannot be something that happened just at the beginning of time. God must be making things always. So God is at this instant creating me and you and, and everything. And if he were to cease doing this, Aquinas would say, nothing, nothing would exist. If uh, <laughs> He forgets me. <laughs> the lecture's over. <laughs> In fact, it's, it's more than over. <laughs> it's hard to imagine that kind of change. It wouldn't be a change. So, all right. So, in this, this second sense indicates that creatures of themselves really do not have their own existence, and therefore, it must be continually supplied, continually given. God stops creating. Everything stops existing. Okay. So these two senses that there's no material cause in creation and that the creatures, in a sense, are uh, remain uh, you know a kind a kind of nothing. Um, these two meanings of creation are, Aquinas would say, what follow from the argument that he just gave you. The argument that. The being of creatures does not really belong to their nature, and therefore must be caused, is explained by saying that God is creating out of nothing, and that means that there's no material cause, and that God has to be continually causing to keep things in being. Okay. You might, Aquinas says, <clears throat> add a third sense to this, and this third sense is that 
you might think in terms of a temporal beginning. You might think that God has, at the very beginning of time, whenever that was, brought things after a complete non-existence into existence. In other words, you might think that there was a first moment of time. In fact, that is, of course, the major view in the uh, Judeo-Christian and Muslim tradition, the, the, the religious interpretations of, of uh, Christianity. Not, not, all, not, all, not all, of course, do hold that, but, but, but that's a sort of dominant uh, interpretation of, the, of, of Genesis, among other texts. And if you, if you take that view, Aquinas says, that's fine, and Aquinas himself thinks that that is true, his point is, it is a strictly theological claim. So the idea that creation indicates a beginning of time, Aquinas thinks is true, but it is not what is philosophically required by the idea that God is the first cause of being. To put this in another way, for Aquinas, it makes logical sense to say that the world always existed for an eternity in the past, and still that this world is entirely created out of nothing. It, it could have been the case, logically. In, in fact, it wasn't. Aquinas didn't think it was the case. But it could have been the case that the world were always in existence, and that uh, and, and still that it was completely created out of nothing. Does that make any sense? You, okay. No. No. no? Oh, okay. Well, if 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 you, if you imagine a world that just you know just had no no it just was always there. Okay, the world just all right. The point is, is such a world would still require God to make it exist as long as it did exist. That's all. So it it, do, it doesn't. It, when people talk about creation, often they think well it's something that happened way back at the beginning of time. Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So you said, you, you, you look at that and you think, okay, creation necessarily is about a beginning. Well, Aquinas says that's not really the kind of heart of what this idea means. The heart of it is that God is causing things without a material cause and he's making things to exist as long as they exist. In fact, it is true that there was a temporal beginning, Aquinas would say, but I only know that on faith. That is a that's a that's a Christian uh, uh, as a matter of Christian revelation for Aquinas. The, the Church actually determined that rather late. Uh, it wasn't until the uh, twelve fifteen actually the Fourth Vatican Council that they could, in, in, in a kind of official way that that that, that doctrine, which which was always held to be true, was actually defined. Okay. All right. Given that, what do creatures do? Well, the basic idea for Aquinas is this. God causes being or existence. What do we cause? Motion, change, uh, generation, uh, alteration. We are moving, changing, um, uh, you know, interacting, um, but we never do what God does. God makes everything to exist, and God, and, and were you not doing that, nothing would exist. But given that things do exist, we, uh, we operate uh, in this existent world, and, 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 and we are the causes of uh, all of the changes that, that, that we observe. Aquinas makes what sounds like a very odd claim, but he, he, he this is, is argues for this. The claim is this. For anything that you choose, it is true to say that God is completely causing it. So right now, there is a noise in this room. Uh, it's the sound of my voice. <laughs> and you are all hearing that sound. And I, you, you may say, well, what is the cause of that sound? Well, if you look at that in terms of the sort of metaphysical foundation, you want to say, well, would that sound exist? Would I exist? Would the airwaves exist? Uh, would this room? You know, none of this would exist if God didn't 
it, we're, we're making it and everything to exist. So, in that sense, it's true. God is causing the, this, the sound. But, if you ask, who's, who's, <laughs> who's, who's causing this voice to be so... The, the, the answer, of mine is to say, it's, it's me. And, and you're asking about a cause of motion. God doesn't move things around. He, he makes things to exist, and existent things are able to move, but it's really a kind of category mistake to say that God is really the cause of my speaking. Uh, really, I am the cause of my speaking. And uh, although it is true that there would be no me, no voice, no, you know, none of this would exist if, if God weren't making it to exist, including me right now. But given that I exist and, and, and all the rest of it, I am really the cause. So for Aquinas, the distinction is the distinction between the, the cause of being, that's what God is doing, and that's, that applies to everything, and God is doing that all the time, and the cause of motion, change, Alteration, generation, whatever, whatever, whatever. However, you want to uh, explain this. These are all the things that we, uh, as creatures, do. One of Aquinas' analogies, and I, I think it's a useful analogy, so I'll, I'll repeat it. Is this: God is a kind of universal cause. He's he's operating all the time. But the fact that he's operating all the time doesn't mean that other things can't also operate, and really so. Aquinas' analogy is the sun. The sun is giving us heat, energy, uh, and um, in medieval cosmology, it's, it's doing other things as well. From our point of view, as people who live on this planet, everything is affected by the sun. Everything. You wouldn't be alive if it weren't for the sun. This planet wouldn't be in its orbit if it weren't for the sun. Uh, there would be no life at all on, on this planet. It, we'd, it, we'd freeze and the planet would go who knows where. And, you know, it, 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 it's, it kind of, everything about what we are is basically determined by the sun. But nobody thinks that that takes away from the fact that, you know, if you ask, well, how did I, <laughs> why? Well, how did I get here? Well, I drove. <laughs> or, you know, how did, how did, how did, you know, how did, how, what did I do at lunch? Well, I, 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 I ate some fish. Or, you know, what, you know, these, you know, these are, it, it's true. None of that could have happened without the sun, but uh, it still it doesn't in any way take a fact, take away from the perfectly natural, obvious causality that's going on in the world. The same Aquinas says is true about God as the cause of being. It's operating everywhere. But it's operating at a, a level that is completely different from what we as creatures do, which basically could be summed up by saying that we, we cause motion. And remember, creation is not a kind of motion or a kind of change. Okay. Uh, another text. Let me, let me just read this. <clears throat> About the things that creatures cause, Aquinas says, God is also the cause, operating more intimately in them than the other causes of motion. Because God is giving being to things. The other causes, by contrast, are the causes that, so to speak, specify that being. The entire being of anything cannot come from some creature, since matter is from God alone. Being, however, is more intimate to anything than those things by which being is specified. Hence, the operation of the creator pertains more to what is intimate in a thing than does the operation of any creaturely cause. The fact, therefore, that a creature is the cause of some other creature does not preclude that God operates immediately in all things, insofar as his power is like an intermediary that joins the power of any secondary cause to its effect. In fact, the power of a creature cannot achieve its effect except by the power of the creator, from whom is all power, preservation of power, and order of cause to effect. For this reason, the causality of the secondary cause, that is the creatures, is rooted in the causality of the primary cause. It, it, you know, what Aquinas is saying is that uh, God, in a sense, is operating in us and in all things in a way more intimately than, than we are. Our, our, our causality is, in, in a sense, more superficial. We, we move, we push things on, on the outside, but, but really, in terms of making things exist that, that, that wouldn't exist, but for God's causality, that's, that's really intimate to all things. And, 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 uh, um, 
harder to see, therefore. All right. There's the right solution. <laughs> ah, what's, what's the wrong way to do this? <laughs> OK. Um, I shouldn't be so tendentious. Uh, Descartes. Almost 400 years later, Descartes, of course, is uh, not a theologian, but he's very theologically literate. He knows his Aquinas, among other things. Um, he uh, uh, is working as a philosopher, but a philosopher who is very, very much aware of the theological implications of his work. Not only that, of course, Descartes is keenly aware about the new science uh, developing in the 17th century. In a number of ways, he anticipates things that we find in Newton. And Descartes is um, like, you know, he's a mathematician. He's also a physicist. Uh, he's he's uh, promoting and trying to advance the, uh, the new uh, physics, the new, new science. Part of the Descartes program, of course, is to prove the existence of God, <laughs> not because he had any doubts about his faith, but Descartes needed to prove the existence of God in order to save the scientific project. That's an interesting story in itself. All right. In the Meditations on First Philosophy, Descartes offers his, uh, actually a number of uh, arguments. Uh, the, the one famous argument, the argument that he gives from, from the idea that, that he has of God is absolutely perfect. God must be the cause of that idea, he could the cause of himself. But then, then Descartes, after he gives that argument, uh, he, he adds what is a, a, a kind of second argument. This is in the third meditation. And the argument goes like this. Descartes says, well, all right, what about my own existence? Could, could I say that I am the cause of my existence? Well, now, here we're, we're at that. beginning to this is sounding a bit like Aquinas, talking about the problem of existence or being. And Aquinas says, Descartes, Descartes says, no, I could not have been the cause of my existence. Why not? Well, says Descartes, I could not have been the cause of my existence because my existence is really a series of moments in duration. I exist at this instant, but there's nothing about the, my existence at this instant that necessitates the fact that I will exist at the next instant. Or, if I exist then, there's nothing about that moment that insists or that, that would require that I exist at the moment after that. In other words, my life is a series of absolutely discrete separate little atoms of time. Each of these moments or atoms of time is completely separate one from the other. And no one of them can cause the next one. Or, and no one of them was caused by the preceding one. So how, how is it possible that I exist from moment to moment to moment? Descartes says the only answer to that, the only possible answer to that is to say that God is creating and recreating me from moment to moment to moment. Right? So I exist at this time, time one, and then at time two, I re-exist. And in between time one and time two, there's a, an imperceptible gap. And at time three, I exist again, and at time four, and five, and so on. My life is like um, a movie before the digital age. You know, what, you know what movies used to be. There were pieces of film, and each frame on 35 millimeter film was separate, and if you run them through the camera at the appropriate speed, it's one image after another. But to you, it looks perfectly continuous. You don't you don't see any gaps. It's uh, it's uh, uh, smooth and flowing and continuous. 
But in fact, really, it's a series of discrete, very imperceptibly separate, but they are separate uh, little moments. That is what Descartes is thinking about in, in terms of, of my life. My life and your life is just a series of completely separate moments. The only way to get from one moment to the other is for God to recreate each moment. And so God has to be creating and recreating me and you. And by the way, this argument applies to anything that exists. And so the entire universe for Descartes is, in terms of duration, a series of separate moments. And God is recreating them moment to moment. Now, it sounds a bit like a Linus, right? I mean, you've got God kind of acting all along. There's no deism here, right? God is, uh, you know, is immediately acting. But what is the problem? Uh, oh, let me just quickly read the Descartes here. Here's Descartes in the third meditation. I do not escape the force of these arguments by supposing that I have always existed as I do now. For if it followed from this, that there was no need to look for any author of my uh, sorry, as if, it, as if it followed from this, that there was no need to look for any author of my existence. For a lifespan can be divided into countless parts, each completely independent of the others, so that it does not follow from the fact that I existed a little while ago that I must exist now, unless there is some cause which, as it were, creates me afresh at this moment, that is, which conserves me. For it is quite clear to anyone who attentively considers the nature of time that the same power and action are needed to conserve anything at each individual moment of its duration as would be required to create the thing anew if it were not yet uh, in existence. Okay. Some comments on this. First, Descartes' argument is an argument not about being, as Quinas said, but it's an argument about duration or time. The crucial thing that Descartes sees about um, creatures is not their existence as such, it's the fact that they are temporal, that they exist in a kind of duration from moment to moment. That's the, that's the crucial thing. Secondly, the fundamental thing that you have to bear in mind about this view is that each of these moments are causally separate. The reason God has to recreate each successive moment is precisely that there's no causal influence from one moment to, to another. Each moment is isolated. Each, one, each is a kind of island in time. And so you can't reach across to, to, the, to the next one uh, in, in order to exert some causality. So each moment of time is unaffected by every other moment. And third, this is a, is a very general argument. As I indicated before, it applies to everything um, in, in, the, in the world, except, of course, to God. It's not in the world. All right. Well, given that, what is the um, implication? Well, the implication is that Descartes must be an occasionalist. He must say that when I decide to move this chair, uh, I'm, 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 I'm making my own decision, but at, at a subsequent moment, that, that chair actually moves. And I, in whatever moments, moment or moments, I'm, I'm, I'm making this decision, I cannot bridge from that moment to the moment in which the chair actually moves. And so that moment needs to be recreated by God, just as all of my preceding moments had to be created by God. And so when I appear to be causing the chair to move, really, it's God. God has recreated that chair at a slightly different position 
and a slightly different position, and so on. It's really, really God who is, who is doing this. I'm not the first person who has noticed that Descartes has a problem with occasionalism. Other scholars have pointed out that, uh, in fact, when Descartes talks about how it is that one material thing can interact with another, Descartes has a difficulty in accounting for that because his notion of matter is of completely inert, extended substance. And this completely inert, extended substance might be something that could be acted upon, but it is not something which itself can, can cause. And so Descartes already, in terms of uh, just non-human reality, according to a number of scholars, has the problem of occasionalism. My view about what, what I'm trying to add to this discussion, uh, and there actually are, there are other scholars who have noticed this as well, but my little addition to this is to say that Descartes' occasionalism is actually uh, much broader. Uh, it, it's, it really it isn't just about material things. Uh, it's true about all creatures. Uh, it's true about whatever we cause about in ourselves. It's true in our mental life, uh, and it's true in, uh, in, in in terms of uh, material things as well. What's the what's the root of all this? Where <laughs> the root of this evil? <laughs> um, okay. Um, here, here, I think, is the, is the problem. Descartes um, comes at these, the problems of things like duration and, and time and motion um, with, I, I think, a very limited sense of what was part of the old tradition of, you know, going back to Aristotle, but through the Middle Ages, of, of thinking very rigorously in terms of natural philosophy and metaphysics about the world. And Descartes was uh, very much taken with the new mathematical ways of thinking about the world. And indeed, mathematical analysis is, is extraordinarily powerful for thinking about um, uh, you know, physics and, and, and new physics. But I think it led Descartes into a fundamental mistake in thinking about things like time and motion. And the mistake is this. Time is built on, on motion. Time is really a kind of measure of, of, of moving things. And motion is not like that movie film that I was talking about. Motion really is a, a continuous reality. Our thinking is always in terms of concepts which are more or less static. We, we tend to freeze things in, into uh, static concepts. And therefore, it is very difficult for us, conceptually, to try to capture what it means for something to move. Uh, Aristotle <laughs> notoriously gave a rather maddening definition but I think it's probably the best that, that, that one can actually do. I'm not going to go through it now, but it's, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a teaser to, to try to work, work here with you. So the point is, he was trying to avoid reducing motion into uh, something that was static, either because it hadn't happened, or something that was static because it already happened. He was trying to capture, in terms of active potency, what it is that's really going on when something moves which is that it is a genuinely flowing reality. So, ladies and gentlemen, that my, my point is that uh, if you're going to try to uh, do this kind of uh, uh, discussion of God's causality, if you want to talk about God as the first cause, you have to avoid, I think you should try to avoid ideas on one hand and occasionalism on the other. And, and um, if your only choice in doing this is uh, Descartes and Aquinas, uh, I go with Aquinas. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you.